Thank you so much. What a, you know, that, that's, that's a wonderful surprise. That, you know, this, this night, um, is, is that it? <laughs> I just, you know, I've been in this 35, 35 years. I just, you know, was that like eight people? I don't know, I just, I guess I expected more. <laughs> this is, this is incredible. I, you know, you're amazing. Gary Clark Jr. and the whole band is just is amazing. Uh, what an amazing night. When uh, I first got the call from the Kennedy Center, I, I would receive the, the Twain Prize. I said to my wife, uh, don't give them any of our credit card information. <laughs> you know, the Kennedys want to give you the twain. <laughs> uh, uh, it just, and it could be yours, it just there's some shipping costs. <laughs> uh, but I, I Googled it. <laughs> um, and it's, it's real. It's a real award. It's incredible, and to see you all here, masked is so f weird, I can't even tell you. <laughs> it does feel like a dystopian movie or like a weird O. Henry story where at the end they say to the comedian, you know, you can perform, but no mouths. There can be, <laughs> you know, and backstage I'm sure the comedians are like, yo, did you see those eye crinkles? I was f killing it. <laughs> oh my God, they were, Squinting. It was amazing. This is a, a, a Faustian bargain, but I'm so glad to, for us to finally be getting back to normal and, and finally getting back to honoring the, the non-essential worker. That's really... <laughs> you're welcome. I think the pandemic taught us one thing. It said, really, you don't need any of us, do you? You just... <laughs> You need the grocery store guy to. <laughs> this, is, this is a wonderful award. To see all my, my friends here and all the people I've worked with for their years, just, it, it reminds me of, of just how many people I carried. <laughs> for so long. Um, there are a lot of jokes about how I look. Touche. <laughs> I am a Jew. This is what happens. <laughs> Black don't crack. But Jews, we age like avocados. <laughs> uh, I have so many people to thank, really, uh, for all this. First and foremost, my mother is here, who is right there. She is gonna be 90. There you go. Come on, woman! This year, she is gonna be 90, or as that's known in the U.S. Senate, a freshman. You know, everybody talked about work ethic. That's where I learned it. When, when 1971 or 1972, my father left the, the family, and we had tough times. It was tough. And she could have rolled over, but she didn't. She got up and she showed me that you're not your circumstances. You're not what happens to you. You're what you make of it. And she got up and she got her gear and she gave us a good life. And I can never repay her for that. And the punchline, my father died 10 years ago. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Who's laughing now? Yeah. I still have issues. Um, I want to thank my brother who was here, my brother who was so academically gifted that I knew I would have to go in a different direction. So, <laughs> I thank him for that. My family is here. That is my boy.
I can't tell you, and this is advice for anybody, if you like to do dumb <laughs> which is something I like very much to do, I cannot recommend more creating a small child <laughs> who also likes to do dumb <laughs> because then you can do the dumb and say, it's what do you want? What? <laughs> little Maggie is also here. Nothing's better than when little Maggie says to me, you want to go for a drive. And we get in the car and we go for a drive. And if any of you want to have a transcendent experience, get in the car with your daughter and drive down the Jersey Shore and listen to J. Cole, She's Mine, parts one and two. <laughs> As the sun is setting and it's beautiful. And uh, I can't be prouder of the both of you. And I love you both so much. Um, and my wife, who, I met my wife on a blind date in 1995. And our first date, I had it all picked out. We went to a little hole in the wall place called Lupe's East LA Kitchen on 6th Avenue and Watts in New York. And we went there because I am a baller. But it was a really interesting date because she didn't say anything the whole time. <laughs> so afterwards, I thought, well, I'll take one last shot. I was walking her back. She lived on Mulberry Street. I said, you want to just duck into a bar real quick and, and, and just have a, a quick drink? Well, one scotch and soda, <laughs> and it was on. <laughs> and I was hooked. And I have to say, again, a lesson for all of you. If you're gonna go on a date, make sure the place has a liquor license. <laughs> because if it doesn't, you could miss out on your favorite person in the world. Love you. Still the best laugh I ever earned. And to all the people that came here tonight uh, to see this, I, I can't thank you enough. It's, it's, it's ironic. I carry around always a quote by Twain. It, it just so happens <laughs> that I am never without it. And it's about ideas. And the quote is, the radical invents the views, but when he has worn them out, the conservative adopts them. And I, and I keep that with me as a reminder that even for Twain, they're not all <laughs> gems. <laughs> even the most celebrated artists amongst us <laughs> the bed. <laughs> but the point is this, what we do is an iterative business. It's a grind, it's work. The best amongst us just keep at it. I began in, in 1987 and my journey began, it's the weirdest thing. I walked into a basement in Greenwich Village called the Comedy Cellar. And when you're a comic, you look in a room and 200 seats are facing one way. And there's one stool and it has a light shining on it. And you walk into that room and go, that's gonna be my chair. I'm gonna sit in that one. And you spend the rest of your career trying to earn that stool. And some nights, man, you don't even belong in the club. You don't even belong on the street. But you get back at it because there isn't any fixed point in comedy where you make it or you don't make it. It's the journey with the greatest friends I could ever possibly have made. And the terrible nights and the great nights and the fun we have sitting at the table. That's what this weekend's been about for me, is catching up with, with great friends and, and sitting at the table and laughing our <laughs> off and us all going like, oh God, what time do we have to be there tonight? <laughs> not, not that you're not great. And there's a lot of talk right now about what's gonna happen to comedy. 
you know, there was the slap. And what does the slap say about comedy? And is comedy gonna survive in this new moment? Now, I've got news for you. Comedy survives every moment. And having Bassam here is a really great example of the true threat to comedy. It's not the woke police that are gonna be an existential threat to comedy. It's not the fresh prince, it's the crown prince. It's not the fragility of audiences, it's the fragility of leaders. You don't owe us anything as an audience. If we say you don't like, say back, do whatever you gotta do. Don't get up and hit us. <laughs> but that's just the game we're in. We talk for a living, you talk back, and we've just gotta be better than you and we've gotta find a way to entertain you. But the threat to comedy, comedy doesn't change the world, but it's a bellwether. We're the banana peel in the coal mine. <laughs> when a society is under threat, comedians are the ones who get sent away first. It's just a reminder to people that democracy is under threat. Authoritarians are the threat to comedy, to art, to music, to thought, to poetry, to progress, to all those things. It's never been all that is a red herring. It ain't the pronoun police, it's the secret police. It always has been and it always will be. And this man's decapitated visage is a reminder to all of us that what we have is fragile and precious. And the way to guard against it isn't to change how audiences think. It's to change how leaders lead. And so I thank you so much for your support tonight and for this award. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.